And again, we're doing very brief overviews, simplifying these um, approaches as much as possible. Um, but we want to look at culture and personality, which also arose out of the Boazian School. Um, two of his students, Ruth Benedict and Margaret Mead, um, are credited with developing this. So it's kind of taking this Boazian approach of cultural relativism and Freud's psychoanalysis, um, specifically about childhood. So Benedict and Mead were interested in studying the relationship by, by, of how we're raised with how it impacts our personality and behavior then as adults. Um, their basic question was, why are people so unique from group to group? So if we use Freudian analysis, um, he claimed that the differences between people came from cultural differences installed in childhood, which seems kind of logical and almost a duh kind of statement. Um, but basically they're just saying that how we're raised it fixes our traits. So for instance, uh, the practice of swaddling was used to explain kind of the loud, boisterous behavior of Russian adults. And the claim was that they were swaddled too tight as babies so that all of this kind of energy then bubbled forth as adults in this, again, kind of loud and boisterous behavior. Now, one of the things that the culture and personality school of thought did was they actually researched different societies and did cross-cultural comparisons or ethnology. And those can be kind of interesting and it does help us to try to understand uh, differences, although the culture and personality school of thought in and of itself isn't all that important anymore. But it was influential again for doing this cross-cultural analyses and that helped us to move the focus to the individual to try to understand behaviors in a culture instead of looking for like these universal laws that were going to apply to everybody. It didn't take anthropology too long to figure out there really were no universal laws of human behavior. Um, so we were forced to kind of search for other explanations. Functionalism is probably one of the most influential theories in anthropology today. It kind of comes out of the Durkheimian school of sociology pioneered by Branislaw Malinowski and Alfred Radcliffe Brown. So what this is just saying is that culture is an interrelated whole, that you can't understand it by looking at these isolated traits. Now hopefully at this point you're going, ooh, it's holistic. Yes, this is where we're really starting to come with this idea. Even though Boaz talked about it, it really starts to become almost codified in functionalism. So cultural relativism is really important in this spot because you need to understand these traits within their context. You know, how are they related to the rest of the um, of the culture? And that's really the only way we're going to be able to um, understand a culture. So how do all these traits work to keep a culture group stable? So what do the various cultural institutions do for the stability of a society? So again, this basic idea has almost become common sense in anthropology today. So we need to understand these interconnections of all these different cultural institutions to understand the culture in general. So throughout this quarter, I'm going to keep pushing you to try to understand what's the function of a trait? What's it doing? I'm going to say this over and over and over again. What is the behavior doing for the people? Um, is that connected then to anything else? So we're going to be looking for surface functions, but also what I re refer to as these deeper underlying functions. There are two schools of thought in functionalism. We have the biocultural approach and structural functionalism. And Man Malinowski is responsible for this biocultural functionalism. So again, explaining culture as this interrelated whole and not a set of isolated traits. And he believed that all of these elements were connected and they worked together to meet the needs of the individuals within that society. So culture existed only to meet the basic biological, psychological, and social needs of individuals. So the structural functional approach by Radcliffe Brown wants to look at social systems in a wider context of many different societies. So again, we're trying to get almost getting into the ethnology part of it. So Radcliffe Brown wanted to know why societies didn't fall apart. So how do all these similar customs that he noticed across cultures 
Do they have this inherent function to keep societies together? So for instance, how does marriage function in a society? Is it the same across societies? So again, just rule comparison. Again, pretty much everybody in anthropology does some type of functionalism today.